Where are you guys at right now? Uh, we're in Hertfordshire. Do you know um, Hitchin? It's like north of London. Okay. I only vaguely, I, I looked up Hertfordshire earlier because I didn't know exactly where that was. Like, is that, yeah. is that considered like... A, like a London suburb or is it like its own? No, it's spot? its own county. Yeah. Okay. So England's made up of different counties, London being one of them. And we're literally just the county above okay. uh, London. Yeah. I got you. Is that also where you grew up? Yeah. Um, so me and Andy actually went to school together. So I've known him since I was 11. Probably. Yeah. Year seven. Year seven. Um, so like, yeah, we've, we, we actually grew up in a little like, town called Welling Garden City um, but we've moved to Hitchin just because there's more going on there's more restaurants bars <laughs> all that kind of stuff yeah it's funny to say like there's more going on because I'm sure you know it's like you're not that far from London right so it's like um, exactly. <laughs> it's, yeah we've got really good connections into London actually we're about 30 minutes into central London um, oh, that's we've got not bad. direct trains to basically most of the major airports as yeah. well which is really good and then we're only 15 minute drive from Luton which is which is really good oh which yeah is because Luton is actually called London Luton, but it's actually in Hertfordshire. Yeah. Which no one ever gets because they fly into London Luton. They're like, oh my God, London. And it's like, <laughs> no, it's about 40 minutes away. <laughs> yeah. I had a I had a flight out of Luton, what, like a super early morning. Oh, I feel so bad for you. Yeah, it was, mate, it's pretty awful, isn't it? It was rough, yeah. Absolutely horrendous place. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, yeah, Luton, yeah. <laughs> I think it's voted one of the top places. That's like, one of the worst places in the UK to live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, just it's just a bleak area oh man i was it so i mean obviously that's not exactly where you grew up but i mean was it growing up there especially like you know age 11 12 when you're kind of becoming your own person and figuring out what you like as opposed to what your parents like all that kind of stuff did it feel like a small town like did it feel did you get bored did it feel like i want to do more what was it like growing up there I don't think so. I, I mean, we had lots of things to do in our town. Um, I think we're quite lucky, to be fair. We had, we had a nice cinema. Um, we had roller uh, skate. a roller yeah. skating rink as nice. well. Yeah. We had like big parks because it's, it's, it's well in Garden City. So they strive on the fact that they're like a very rural area, but also there's lots of like greenery, lots of like fields, trees. Yeah. They try and keep like a, a good ratio of like grass to building sort right, of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, they leaned into it, right? It's like, yeah, yeah it's exactly. going to be out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, it, was, it wasn't too bad. Like, we had a shopping center as well. We just used to hang out, like, at Mackey D's, McDonald's, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. sit there and eat burgers, I guess. That was the, the thing to do as a teenager. <laughs> eat burgers. Yeah. I would eat burgers. Oh, I just eat them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> by myself. <laughs> oh, man. Well, because I feel like, yeah, it, I mean, it sounds like, yeah, maybe maybe you got enough to do there. But I feel like uh, for a lot of kids, especially creative kids growing up in a smaller place, it's like either either you go deep into like an area of interest, like music or something. And, you know, just you, you get really into it. You find it on your own or there's another road where like you just get into a lot of trouble right? because <laughs> it's just yeah. there's not enough to do. But yeah, it sounds like maybe there was enough to do where you guys were. <laughs> yeah, like um, it's it's quite an affluent area, so you you I feel like the the way you brought up there is is a bit different to like the likes of Luton and um, <laughs> London. Like uh, people don't really get into trouble, really. Yeah, we're quite lucky in the area that we live um, for, for for us to have like a decent and good upbringing. Um, a lot of our friends, family and stuff have had a really good upbringing and yeah, there's not been that sort of struggle or anything. Yeah. Um, That's good. Yeah. I mean, what, what brought you, why there, I guess is, is the real question. Like what brought your folks there? I think it was a while back people leaving London cause it was just on the outskirts. It was sort of like when housing crisis started to happen it's like way too difficult to buy a place in london yeah. so then they're just moving to the outskirts where you've still got a 20 minute 30 minute train ride into london but it's not the hustle and bustle you've got the fresh air you've got the countryside a little bit mm. but it's still really good connections in so i mean a lot of people have moved from london to these areas just so they can not live in the smog of london and be outside a little bit but could still dip their toes in as much as possible 
Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, fun fact actually. So I, I moved to Wellin in 2004. And before that, I used to live in London. So uh, my parents are both from the Philippines. We got to England the year 2000. So we, I think London was like the first port of call just because it's the only place you know. Right. Um, right. So we lived there for a bit and then we moved to Hertfordshire because it was just nicer. And yeah, ever since then, I've kind of stayed here. Do you have memories from the Philippines? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so I didn't live there for too long. I've kind of been about like, so I, I lived in the Philippines for a bit and I lived in Japan for a bit because my dad, um, at the time he worked like four jobs. So he's, he was, he's, he's a scientist, but he was like a student at the time. And he also was a musician and a radio host. Oh, and I wow. think that's, probably, yeah, I mean, that's probably where the music for me has come from, like just being around him. He's always playing tunes or whatever. Um, that's crazy. So, yeah. so, was he doing like the, the scientist researcher thing at the same time as the radio host musician? Yeah, I think because in Japan, it just didn't pay that well. Um, so he just had to do it to keep, well, my mom at the time wasn't working because she had to look after me and my sister. So he was kind of like the the breadwinner in that case. He just had to work a lot, essentially. Yeah. That man, that's fascinating. That's like, because, you know, that the the sort of more stereotypical version of that is like you do the science thing for a long time. And then after a while, you, you know, you either retire and then you find this passion for music or, you know, music is kind of like the side thing. Yeah. But to be doing both of them at the same time, that's uh, that's crazy, man. Because, you know, I talk to plenty of people about hustles in the music industry and like the little side jobs we've all had to take at one point or another and how you can kind of, you know, beyond sort of the the artist facing thing that everyone sees on your Instagram or whatever that, you know, everyone's like figuring out ways to make it work along the way. But I never really thought about it for like other jobs. Like I never, I never would have imagined a, a scientist would also be a radio host. You know what I mean? Yeah. Probably just his passion. <laughs> uh, like, I, I know he loves music. Maybe he's vicariously living through for us. I was about to say yeah, exact <laughs> statement. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting that. Yeah. What do you know like what kind of music he would play or like what kind of radio show it was? Um so I listened to a lot of when I grew up, like kind of singer songwriter type thing, uh like Billy Joel, Steely Dan. Yeah, uh, like that's yeah. a bit of funk. Uh, Jim, Kutch, I can't say his name. Jim Crutchy. Oh, God. <laughs> oh yeah, God, like C R O C E. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. The one. I don't know how to um, say that either. <laughs> yeah, I get afraid to say it. I'm like, <laughs> I get afraid to say. It. Um, yeah, like a lot of that kind of stuff. But he he does like electronic stuff as well. Um, he loves the classic Calvin Harris, David Guetta, <laughs> like typical, you know. But I would but love you, to see you know the classics, yeah. David, <laughs> David Getter and Calvin Harris, <laughs> mate, all rocking the one packs. He's got a bottle of Moe in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And were you were you playing instruments as a kid as well? Yeah, so I actually was in bands before doing Tabasco. So I I, I loved to play the drums. Um, I used to play guitar and singing for that band. So I've I've always been around music growing up um i think it's always been like a boyhood dream to be doing that um in some form um yeah. so it's quite nice to to do it now i guess yeah of course yeah and i'm sure you, I, and you tell me i don't know how much you talk to your dad about it in the early days but i feel like as a kid you know kids pick up on like little subtle stuff more than adults realize and i wonder i wonder if you know i assume at some point maybe he had similar aspirations and maybe you know, in some subtle way as a kid, you even sort of pick up on that, that like, even the thought that like, maybe this is something I could want to do, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's interesting that because I never really thought it could be a career. I think that's probably the same as you, Andy, like yeah. music wasn't like, we both went to uni, we, we kind of thought that our lives would be a bit more linear, if you call it. Yeah. Um. So I never thought that music can actually be a career but it's just something i dreamed about and i was like, oh, i'd love to to do music as a job and right. <laughs> it's quite nice to to be in that position quite lucky yeah oh of course man yeah i mean and that's i, I talk about this all the time too like that's the the real success to me is just the fact that that anyone's here doing it you know because i think people 
in this kind of thing, and and maybe you guys can talk about where you're at with this too, because it's always changing, I think, for everyone at every stage of the career of like, what what is the point of this whole thing? Like, what is success? What do we actually want out of this? Because it, it, it's such a weird thing that we all forget that just by being here, doing this full time professionally, whatever you want to call it, it's like, already you're in the top 1% of people yeah. who have, yeah. are trying to do this. It's such a weird thought. So weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, it's, yeah, it's a weird one. Like, we just, we, we don't really think about it too much. We just kind of make the music and just hope for the best. It's always been like that since the start of the project. Um, I guess for me personally, success is, it, ooh, I think success is, just being able to make music every day if I wanted to or yeah. play shows. I don't know about you, Andy. Yeah, I, th I think for me, it'd be like the longevity of it. Like, I don't feel, I mean, I feel successful as a musician at the moment, but I don't feel fully successful because it's such a fickle industry yeah. and it could, it could all crumble at any second. I mean, no mm. one saw COVID coming in COVID-19, no one saw that in 2020. Careers would have been broken from that. Yeah. There, there'd be some musicians that who were coming up at the time and now working in a coffee shop trying to, again to make it. And yeah. how many people get a second break? And how many people get that second chance to be able to do it? So if I and, and I don't even know if this is ever something that's viable, but like being able to say I've got longevity within this career, I know that if even if something big and catastrophic happened again, we'd be able to bounce back off of it. I don't know if it's feasible to say what that thing is and how that would feel, but yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely the longevity. If we, if we can get something yeah. like that that's tangible that you can go right, we know that we're pretty safe for a while. Then that I I feel extremely successful within yeah. you know, ourselves. Those are both actually really good answers. Yeah, yeah, having some kind of feeling like you're stable that's huge. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's very difficult because I think a lot of up and coming artists never feel like that, and I feel like. You could even ask a lot of the fully established artists that we think that are going to be around for the yeah. next 20 years. Yeah. Do you feel stable? And they'll go, you know what? I could, if, if I stop or if I take my foot off the gas, my career could fall in a year. And yeah. those yeah. are huge headline DJs and artists and musicians. And you really do have to just keep your foot on the gas at all times. Otherwise, yeah, it can just fall apart quite quickly. Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy, man. I tell you, you just made me think. Uh, I I was talking to Diplo on here, and he, you know, I was asking him because he, you know, nobody works harder than him. He's like that dude oh, yeah. doesn't sleep. Yeah. He just goes crazy the whole time. And and I asked him, and he was like, "Oh yeah, it doesn't make any sense." And he's like, "I thought they would have like gotten sick of me a long time ago." He's like, "It doesn't make any sense to me that this is still working." But because yeah. it is still working, like that's why my foot is still on the gas. You know, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's like, I feel like I sort of lucked into some kind of, you know, bonus round of this. Yeah. And but it's, you know, but it's funny to hear from him, who's like, you know, the one of the most successful people doing this whole thing. Yeah. It's yeah. I don't know. That mentality, I think, just never goes away, yeah, at I least for some will. people. I think you all I think with any artist, I like people would always want more. I think once you hit like a milestone, it's never enough. It's actually, it's kind of sad, like <laughs> in the sense that you always kind of try for more. There's never a point where, you know, you potentially you feel comfortable. There's always that doubt, I guess. Constantly checking um, that carrot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I guess that's part of the excitement as well. Um, you never feel complete. You never feel done. It's, yeah. it's, it's always something else. Let's do this. Let's do a bigger show. Let's sell it out more. Let's just do some more streams. Let's do this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, to, to bring it back to you guys, like in that vein, what are you guys looking at right now as far as like, you know, oh, this is this is maybe actually on the horizon or this is something we could maybe think about doing, maybe something that you wouldn't have been able to think about, you know, a year or two ago, that kind of thing, because it seems like right now, I don't know, it, it, I, I'm seeing your music everywhere. I feel like a bunch of people are talking about <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for us, so we, we we really want to be making an album at the moment. It's something that we've wanted to do for a while. We know that we're studio producers. We know that we can make records. We want to do something that's sort of has a narrative. Everything's cohesive with itself. The artwork fits the music. 
there's some sort of narrative with the artwork flowing into sort of a music video, something like that. Um, I think along the lines of like Tisha's latest album, so yeah. incredible. Oh, yeah. So good. I think it's all of the music good. on that is incredible. Yeah. The artwork's incredible, which leads into all the music videos and the branding. Uh, the branding and everything like that. I think that would be like a complete thing for us. And we've wanted to do an album for a while now. So I think it's just being able to get a hold of it and go, you know what, let's 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 nail it soon. Yeah, I think with that as well, it kind of comes part and part, but we've we see our, our, the future of our career in a live space. So we really want to build, this is what we're, we're trying to do at the moment, is build a live set. Um, just because I think our music caters more towards a live setting. Um, like yeah. DJing is great, uh, but you know we don't, we don't actually play our tunes that much because I feel like when you're DJing, you've got to find the right tune, even if it's not yours, you know, um, the right vibe for it. But I feel like, Doing a live set is almost like showcasing your art, and I think that fits mm-hmm. our vision a lot better. So um, that's like, I guess, the next the next steps for us is to build that out alongside that's, the yeah. album. That, I mean, yeah, that's those are also great goals. Have you done any live shows or like hybrid live shows yet? So we we've only done one. So we had a, a two track EP about two years ago during COVID. Actually, we um, did like a little live performance of the two tracks. So it was only 15 minutes long, um, but we did it on a uh, stage space that was empty to sort of highlight the fact that all these stages are barren these days. Uh, and derelict. Like, derelict because of COVID. COVID. And how it's an empty space that the artists aren't, haven't got a platform to work on. And we did a music video for that, so it was all filmed live. Um, other than that, we've been playing a lot of the live, a lot of our tunes live, just haven't constructed fully a live performance yet. Yeah. But that's definitely going to be coming this year. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And do you, Andy, do you play instruments as well? I don't know. So I never came from like a music background at all. Um, I was more into sort of um, amateur dramatics and stuff like that. So I was on the stage for quite a bit growing up. Okay. That's, um, I, I kind of had a similar background when I was a kid. I was awesome. like more on that side than I was on music until I got to, to college, to uni. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So I, I got into it sort of in secondary school and I played a f- a few of the shows um, for our school. And then I got into sort of a, a club in the background and then started doing shows at my local theatre. Um, and just, yeah, growing up, doing loads, doing probably about three or four shows a year um, until the whole music thing took over. And unfortunately now I, I, I don't really have time to be able to put into doing any shows anymore. It's a big commitment, sort of, right? It's, it's a shame. Yeah, it's this huge commitment. You've got to be able to say, right, in seven months' time, I can do this run of shows for 10 days and I can do all these rehearsals and I can learn all these lines. But realistically, I don't know where I'm going to be in seven months' time. I could be in America, I could be in Australia, and I can't commit and say I can do this show in that long time. Yeah. Um, which is a shame, but I mean, it's 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 something that I have to do for the passion of music. And it's, it's my job now, isn't it, music? So it's something that I just have to... Um, be able to sort of give up. But it is a shame, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like to a certain extent, the theater background, there, there's a lot of links between any like performing arts, right? Like, do you, I, I guess I should ask you instead of just saying it, but do you feel like the theater background, like, is there any of that, anything you learned either on stage or like backstage, seeing how shows are put together, any of that that you've sort of brought with you, anything you can apply to what you're think, doing now? I think definitely the confidence to be able to go on stage as a DJ. I, I, I don't get anxious and nervous or anything like that because I know I've gone on stage and I've recited Shakespeare in front of a thousand people. Yeah. <laughs> and I know if I could do that, I can go and twist the knobs on stage. So it's quite yeah. easy. Twist a few knobs, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely something like that. But from the, the back end of stuff, yeah, seeing seeing something get put together um, like a, um, a a show, like a theatre show, like Shakespeare or something like that. It has a lot of similarities and links to like a, a, a performance, like a live show or a DJ show. Whereas again, you're you're not just playing music; you're telling a narrative. Your your light show, sound, everything just cohesively puts into mm. one. Um, yeah, yes, that's true too. So many crossovers and so many crossovers from it. Yeah, that's a yeah. I never even thought about it that way, but you're right. And that what you were just talking about with like the album and sort of making more of a like a cohesive narrative, all of that kind of thing. I think it would certainly play into that as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like being on stage is 
kind of knacked as well, you know, because there'll be times where you're really, really tired, <laughs> especially like if you've been traveling and you just got to get on with it. You can't be looking glum behind the deck. So you have to bring the energy. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that probably, I can imagine that applies as well. Yeah. So we had, we had, we had a show once in London and uh, the morning of the show, I woke up and I had an abscess in my mouth on oh, my yeah. tooth. Um, oh. extremely painful. Went to the dentist. They gave me some, um, painkillers, strong painkillers for it and some, um, antibiotics to reduce the swelling. And, uh, I got to the show and I said to my manager, I was like, I am just so spacey off these painkillers. I'm in so much pain, but I, you have to just go on stage and I can't look sad. I can't look <laughs> I mean, I just got to go and perform, but a warehouse project wasn't it yeah yeah it was the day after yes yeah, so we, warehouse, we did a warehouse project oh, wow. the day after that as well and it was yeah it was yeah it, it was bad. <laughs> i mean how did how did it go did you do you think people could tell no i don't think so i mean i told everybody <laughs> <laughs> apart, from okay. the face, though. apart from the swollen face yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, had, we had a videographer there as well so <laughs> I, I had to be hiding with one of the other yeah. it was bloomed up it well that's crazy. that's a difference from i guess from the theater is that yeah sometimes sometimes it's better to be honest and just be like, oh yeah, like this is going to, this whole thing's going to be a little weird and here's why. Cause I think yeah. when, when people are in the room with you like that, all, all they're really looking for is to, to connect with you and to have it and to be comfortable. Right. Like I always yeah. think about just like, how can I make the audience comfortable? Cause as long yeah. as they're comfortable, that's, probably going to ensure that we're going to all have a better time. Right. Yeah. Totally. And so as, as long as they're not feeling like, yeah, like, Oh, why is he acting weird and pretending nothing's happening? You know, that sort of thing, yeah. which I guess is different from theater because theater, like the show has to go on regardless. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Did you have any, uh, uh, big roles? Like what was the biggest role you played? Um, uh, uh, I played Duke Orsino in Twelfth Night, um, Shakespeare. Um, so he, he was the king. That was quite a big part um, in one of my local theatre productions. I did a semi-professional production in Cornwall. I've done it. Tw I've done twice with the same company. There's a theatre called the Minac Theatre, which is amazing. You should look it up. It's um, it's a theatre carved right into the cliff face, so it looks like you're oh, in wow. like Greece, like an amphitheatre, but like in Cornwall, and it's it's beautiful. We go down there each summer. Um, and when you're saying to the show must go on, like it, even if it rains and stuff, it, it, we just continue acting. Oh, wow. it's really, really distracting actually, because well, if it's forecast to rain, obviously the actors and stuff don't. We can't have umbrellas. We're in our costume regardless. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but all of the all of the um, people coming to watch the show, all the public, they have their like ponchos and their umbrellas. So mid, I might be mid monologue, hundred words deep. And all of a sudden it starts to rain and you've got a thousand people in front of you start to rustle and put up their umbrellas and start moving it around. Shh. And then you've got someone in the front row handing out scotch eggs and you've got like, oh, what vibe they scotch eggs. You've got all this going on. All this stuff going on. Yeah. It's like a party, mate. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I've done a couple of shows there. I did Alice in Wonderland there. I played the Mad Hatter, which is quite fun. Oh, that's um, great. I, d uh, I was the, uh, I was the turtle in uh, Alice in Wonderland. Oh, well, that's, nice. yeah. that's yeah. a good role. <laughs> he, he, that's, that's Caterpillar smoking the pipe. Yeah, yeah, that's the Caterpillar. That was my buddy. Yeah. Turtle was <laughs> like the, uh, I can't even remember. It's the, do you remember the name of it? It's not the turtle. It's like the, this I can't remember. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. But that was fun. I still remember that one being super fun. Yeah, <laughs> and we based my um, my Mad Hatter on uh, Russell Brand, so he was a bit of a <laughs> bit of a Cockney geezer. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were just like, we just want to make you look like a heroin addict for some reason. It's like, <laughs> so like, not much changed then, eh? <laughs> exactly. Like, Show yourself, Andy. So we had white face, we had long like hair on it, and yeah, it was it was it was, it was a lot of fun actually. That that sounds great, man. Yeah, I like. The, it, it's funny because for what we do, I, I'm always trying to think of ways to make shows a little more theatrical. Like I like a show. I like, mm. you know, a, a little a little flash to it, a little like, you know, over the top -ness. But then with dance music, you it's weird because you have to be so careful with anything like that because it can get corny or, and cheesy mm -hmm. like so yeah. quickly. 
and yeah. I, and I don't I don't know. I'm actually let me ask you because in the states, like the the EDM thing for like the last ten years was was such a like transformative wave in the states, and so now I think at least for me personally, I'm like so attuned to anything. Like I don't want to do anything that's even a little bit cheesy or corny because yeah. of like how ridiculous some of the EDM stuff got. Like how much of that did you experience over in the UK? Like did it did the whole EDM thing like change your mindset a lot? Was it like a big thing there? Not really, no. I think like growing up the the big things that we used to listen to was like I guess Martin Garrix and Skrillex, we were in that era, but like it wasn't it wasn't really cheesy. I think now it's you you probably wouldn't get away with that. People probably chuck smiles at you if you're going, <laughs> sure, sure, I don't sure. know, doing something weird on I don't know. Um it's yeah. I mean they're, it's they're yeah. sort of timeless though, aren't they, as well? Yeah. Like I mean they were huge in like the clubbing scene, especially in the u- the university scene, like all those yeah. club nights that you go to. Maybe not on the big festival stage in the UK. Um they don't they don't really tick the boxes, I don't think, too much. But in those smaller clubs, you can go to those smaller clubs and you'll hear Avicii, Martin Garrix, Relax yeah, sure, sure. almost constantly. And I think there's sort of timeless tracks. Well, yeah, don't get me it. wrong. Like there were anthems and um, incredible songs that came out of that period. Like everyone you just named is not even really who I was talking about. It's like, you know, the Skrillexes and the Martin Garrixes of the world, like they're the, they were the pioneers of, of yeah. that stuff, you know? And like, you go back and you listen to Animals and like Animals is fucking, it's a weird good, song. Man. Like it's interesting. Yeah. It's it's a yeah. weird song. And you know, what came after it was a lot of people sort of trying to copy that formula, but like Animals itself, like I'm I'm super down with Animal. Like that's, that yeah. to me, it's just like, this is weird. I kind of like it, you know, it, because there was no precedent for it before then. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. kind of everything that came afterwards and just like, I don't know, at least here it got so commercialized too. Like the money yeah. started coming in and people were just making songs, hoping to like make money off of them or to have the song licensed, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think EDM never really took off, but I think off the back of that kind of whole EDM uh, rise in the US, in the UK, I think it's like tech house, as in tech house that are more like, not saying this is like a awful thing. I think everyone eats their own. You know, everyone loves whatever music you you love. Disclaimer. <laughs> but, disclaimer. <laughs> um, but like um, a lot of like tech house, like edits stuff, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably what's um, reflective of that kind of EDM rise and that thing that you're talking about. Um, it's like formulaic music. Yeah. Isn't it? It's like if you get a recipe for EDM, that's what they tried to copy with animals. And right. sort of like the same thing with tech house as well. It's formulaic. You find a sample that everyone knows just like a Beyonce sample. Yeah. You put anything big build up, big rise, boom, crash, big drop, funky baseline, that's re- that. regular house hats. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and, then, and, then yeah. Stuff. and then it's like, boom, that's a hit. Yeah. And it's almost like, where's the creativity in that? I'm not saying it's bad because people listen to it and people love it and people dance to it. But like, do you feel like you're creating that bit of music or do you feel like you're just ticking boxes at this point? Right. Yeah. And it's kind of for some people, I think that can sort of just be like a stop on the way to wherever they're going on their artistic journey. And I think that's totally fine, too, because I think, you know, all of us like learn how to do music in general by, you know, you copy something first to figure out how it's done. And then you sort of figure out later on, like what you want to say and you get a little toolkit of shit you're able to do and, you know, go from there, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, it's it's weird. It's weird, too, because I think uh, I don't know. A lot of labels are part of this, too, because then labels are chasing hits and it's like Mm -hmm. what they want is the formulaic thing for Mm -hmm. a lot of them. And that's sort of a frustrating thing, too. Yeah, it's, it's I think weird. it's interesting that because I think going come back to the whole conversation about longevity of a career, I feel like not saying disclaimer again, not not, <laughs> yeah, not yeah. throwing any punches to um, any artist out there who, who does this, but I think if you that's kind of the easy way into the music industry. But I think the issue with that is is since it's so formulaic, you don't really have a fingerprint, like an identity as a as an artist. Therefore, it's harder for you to kind of form that fan base to form 
the cult following that really love your sound yeah. because you sound like everyone else. So, I mean, each to their own, but for me personally, I think it's important to find your own sound away from that to, to have a credible artist proposition, if you call it. Yeah, well, I, I agree completely. And I think that's a good way to, to bring this back to Tabasco is, you know, your guys' sound in the last few years, I, I think, has seen a lot of evolution and is almost it, it, it's funny. Correct me if you disagree with this statement, but I feel like as opposed to like focusing in, it's almost gotten wider and you're yeah. you're trying out, you know, different things. There's like, you know, elements of of breaks and techno and trance and house. There's like and, and even other stuff, too. And it's interesting because I think what's the right way to say this? It's like it's it's less identifiable sonically, but it's more identifiable in the way that it feels, if that makes yeah. sense. I feel like there's a lot of cr across our catalog. If you listen to our music, it all sounds quite cohesive, even though it stretches from genre to genre. Yeah. So like our latest track, Hot, if you listen to it, there's there's elements in there, the pads, there's some of the drums and stuff that you could hear on an older track like, like Traces, which is completely different in terms of genre and style. Mm. But there's always that one or two things that you can listen to and go, yeah, that's a Tabasco track, which I really, really love about us. Yeah. The fact that it brings it back to us. And I feel like the, the music that we we have in our back catalog really reflects um, the music that we play in our DJ sets. Because if you give us two or three hours in a DJ set, we're going to go from breaks, house, um, drum and bass, techno, trance. Disco. We're going to take you disco, all of these different things. And I feel like if we're playing in our sets, why don't we have the, the arsenal of our own tunes to be able to play those as well? And that's what we want to be able to do. Yeah, I feel like we're quite experimental with our approach to music. Like, um, we always try to do stuff that it's almost like testing our producer ability and also just to kind of push the book out a little bit. So for example, we had a, our seven track EP that we did. Uh, one of the tracks in it goes from 128 BPM to 160. So it goes from like a break beat to jungle essentially, but stuff like that, we just like, let's just try you know, do something. Let's just play around. Yeah, set yourself uh, limitations in the studio and see what you come up with. So we made a, we made a track on the same seven track EP. We, we we didn't have a kick. We didn't want a kick sample to be in there. So we had other elements that act as a kick, but it's technically not a kick in there, and it still works as a track. That's interesting. Do you ever do you ever have that discussion of is you know you make something? It's like is this a Tabasco track? Oh, yeah, 100%. Totally, yeah, totally. yeah, all the time. <laughs> Most times we're in the studio. It's like, like do we do yo. we go, is this a Tabasco track? Like yeah, so maybe oh. not. It's like in that case, how do we make it a Tabasco track? Yeah. And how do we then transform it? Okay, let's think about the pads, let's think about the drums, do they work the breakdown, the synths. Mm. We we look at the uh, different elements individually and we discuss. Yeah, this. well, well, that's interesting. Talking about like the DNA of the songs is interesting because uh, I wonder, you know, if genre wise, you're you're dabbling in a few different places. Are there are there like component pieces that you guys go to often as far as like a particular synth sound or like a certain yeah. set of samples, that kind of thing? Yeah, so we we like to use a lot of like modular sounding stuff, whether it's like one shots or we make a loop out of it. I think because we think the modular sound sounds more organic. So there's a touch of hum humanity in it. Like it's not perfect. There's a little bit of rawness. This is sounding like super pretentious. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Thing, um, we find quite attractive to, to put into our music is not make it sound like it's just one loop. We want to make it sound organic, you know, like there's movement in there. It's like it's alive. And not making a mix sound too clean either. Yeah. I think that's what a lot of producers try and do in an early stage of their career. They look at a track and they go, how do I make this sound so clean and so perfect? Mm. And really, a bit of muddiness and a bit of grit, a bit of yeah, modular sound actually makes a track sound better. Yeah. Which is, it sounds like it, it shouldn't do. Yeah. But, well, it, yeah, it, it adds, it's almost like, uh, it's almost like in a weird way, like manufacturing nostalgia to like yeah. fuck with the mix a little bit because we're used to listening to like old like classic tracks and part of the reason when you listen to it that you know it's from a different era is because like you can tell 
you know, engineering wise that it was just done differently than sort of the standard of today. That's really interesting. I never thought about that, but I think you're right that, yeah, kind of having that imperfect mix, it's 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 almost a trick to like take it out of time a little bit. You know what you I know mean? Who yeah. that, that trick from? Who's that? The, the great, great Pete Tong. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> We we um we sent uh, a demo, didn't we? We sent him a demo, yeah. uh, which was actually Akaro, one of our uh, bigger tracks, um, because he was uh, licensing some of our tracks to his label Three Six Zero over in the states. Um, and we sent it to him, and he goes, "Guys, it's it's too clean. It's it's too it's too perfect. It's too it, it sounds it's nice. Clean. It's too everything fits nicely. Yeah, add yeah. some distortion in the low end. Add some rumble. Add some yeah. grit. Add a bit of texture and." Make it more warehousey. He said um, it just sound. It wouldn't hit the clubs as well because it sounds so perfect, like pristine. And when you're in a grotty rave in England, for example, in this warehouse, you kind of want a bit of that that grit, that rumble. meat, you know, that yeah. rumble, that in like I like to describe roughness. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what we did. We just saturators up in the mix. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was, it was it came out great at the end of it. Yeah. And, and yeah, I. That was amazing little tip from Pete. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really good, man. And you know, for for him, he's one of the he's one of the people where I would just kind of listen to anything he's got to say. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, he's just yeah. seen so many generations of of records come over his desk. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you kind of grew up together, right? Like at least from the formative years, like at least you knew each other from like yeah. what you said, eleven, yeah. twelve, that kind of thing. Um, what were you, were you like friends then? Were you hanging out back then? I, I, th I don't think we were like friends, friends from the early age. We had the same group of friends and we always sort yeah. of hung around in the same areas at school and stuff. But it wasn't like a proper, proper friendship that we had. I think that only really came about during sort of sixth form. Yeah. Um, so sixth form is after you leave school, you do your sort of pre-university studies, two more years. And then Got those it. are the exams that you take into university. Um, and then you sort of the our, our school will go, goes from like about 300 students to about like 50 to 60 yeah. students who want to stay on for sixth form. So then it gets condensed down and then you're hanging out with people a little bit more that you might not have done. So I think we started hanging out more so then. Yeah. Um, I think we've got, we've got the same group of friends as we do now than we did when we were 11 years old. So we've, we've grown up with the same people. That's the Quite best. lucky in that sense. Oh, we're so lucky. Dude, yeah, I, we're I, I, it's, I'm, I'm the same. Like my closest friends are the, the yeah. kids I was in high school with. And still to this day, like I talk to them every day. And, yeah. and we have those conversations of how lucky we feel about that. It's like, it's a crazy thing. Okay. I think it's really rare. It's super Not rare. Totally. Yeah, I don't know many other people that I know that, that, that yeah. have, have sort of a big group of friends that they were with during secondary school. Most people, they have one or two friends dotted around, maybe from university or yeah. from back home, but they don't see them as much. But yep. no, pretty much every weekend, there's something going on in our friendship group. There's a birthday, there's something, someone's going out, someone's doing something, it's a Tabasco show, something <laughs> along those lines. And they're also <laughs> so, so great um, at coming to our shows I think, yeah, very most, supportive. Most really, really supportive group of friends. Um, was anyone most, else in that group uh, musically inclined? Like, did you have, you know, in terms of even just like going out to shows, that kind of thing? Did you have a little yeah, crew? Yeah, yeah, there is, yeah. I think, I think quite a few of them are still. Maybe not as much electronically leaning for the mo vast majority of them. There's definitely some people in there who are very much inclined with the music that me and Ken produce and we listen to as well. Mm. So we've got a small group um, group chat on WhatsApp, uh, just passing around sort of really niche electronic music, which is really cool. Um, yeah. And then the rest of them sort of, they like the um, sort of festival scene, but maybe they like bands a little bit more, but they'll come and see electronic artists as well. Yeah, that, that's nice, man. I mean, and, best group, yeah. Yeah, no, that's it really is the best. It's so valuable. <laughs> It, it also makes me wonder for you guys in terms of dance music, electronic music, what were your early exposures to that? Do you remember either like the the first, you know, like electronic records you heard or later on, like some experience with dance music that really was the one that like flipped the light switch for you? Yeah. So funny thing is, I in terms of dance, dance music, Andy's actually the one that introduced me to it. Um, oh, amazing. Is when we were like, 18 when we first started going out um you i think i remember the first night out uh we went to a club called egg 
in London. And that was kind of like my first introduction into electronic music. Um, I remember Andy, you'd send me tracks from um, like Martin Eichen, Dusky, that kind of stuff. Um, that was really cool. But I think before that, I was more like live music and, you know, like disco. But I mean, disco wouldn't really fall under electronic music, in my opinion. Sure. It's, like, it's dance music, but it's not electronic. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know about you, like... Uh, yeah. yeah. So early, early stuff, I think the first time I probably got introduced to dance music was actually incredible. We are at a festival in Bilbao, uh, BBK, and Fatboy Slim was headlining. And that was one of the first times yeah. I went there and was like, what the hell is this? What's going on? <laughs> it, was a, it was a crazy experience. It was in northern Spain. It was up a mountain. And yeah, I think it was some indie bands beforehand and some rock bands. I think it was Green Day and Two Door Cinema Club playing beforehand. Yeah. And then they shut down and it was like everyone over to the dance stage. And it was like, who's playing Fatboy Slim? I was like, I know a couple of his tunes, Rockefeller Scandal, yeah, yeah, the big yeah. one, Celebrate. Um and then yeah, we go over there and he's got this amazing set. I think he was on for two hours and just the energy that he had was incredible. And I'm, I mean, still to this day, I mean, we supported him a couple yeah. of months back. At, oh, wow. In, in, in insane, England. Man. Um, and he, I mean, this, the, the show is still the same. It's still so incredibly like energetic, performance heavy. And yeah, I mean, the stuff he does visually as well with his visual effects and stuff. It's, yeah, it's incredible. Man, did you get to talk to him at all when you were supporting him on the show? Yeah, we, we actually, we didn't, not when we supported we, we saw him in, when we, we did our first America tour, we played the same festival. Um, so I think he was just backstage and we were like, we just have to talk to him. Like, this is, this is Fat Boy's name is Norman. So he just, we, I'm, I was quite drunk as well, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> so I went up to that him helps. and I was like, we love you. Like we well, we had a bit of an in because uh, he's part of the same agency as us. So yeah. we, when we spoke to him, we were sort of like, because our agent sits on the board with his agent. So I don't think they're exactly the same agent, but they know each other roughly. Right. So we was like, you know Jenna Dooling, don't you? Yeah. He was like, Huh? Like, you know, Jenna Dooling, don't you? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, WME, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, how you doing, boys? Like, oh, we, we played earlier. And then yeah. like, it was one of those moments where, you're like, okay, you go do your thing now. We said hello. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Too scared. <laughs> Too scared. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he's an interesting one, man, because he, uh, yeah, he's another one. Like, what it makes me think about that conversation we were having earlier about, like, what is success? Because, you know, for him, like, late 90s, 2000, early 2000s, like, you know, he was this celebrity almost like yeah. beyond like, you know, big musician. He was like a celebrity. And yeah. even in the States, you know, I was a teenager and like seeing those videos with Christopher Walken dancing and, you know, oh, all yeah. of that. <laughs> it, it was insane. But that was so long ago. Right. And he's still around and he's still like you said he's doing these two hour dj sets and you know still like there's this there's there's this like joyful sense in everything he does you know i think even yeah. to this day and uh, yeah i i don't know if i have a point exactly other than that it seems like he's been able to keep finding the fun of it long after he sort of had that insane peak Mm, and yeah, yeah. I, I think that's pretty admirable, too, because it doesn't seem like he's kind of just like let the machine keep running. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I think it's due to the as well, the immortalization of a couple of his tunes that I think will, mm. will live on forever. I mean, things like Praise You, yeah. Rockefeller Skank. I mean, you, you watch any film that's out over the last like 10 years and stuff you, or like TV show or something. They're always going to have like a fat boy slim um track in it or something like that it, it, it just sort of uh it just sort of happened so i think yeah the immortalization of his tunes sort of pushed and propelled his career even to younger yeah. generations so people who are like 18 going out raving now they were born way past sort of his his era his era yeah. but it, it, it's still long going and then like everyone just knows fat West is is yeah, yeah absolute yeah. idol the thing the thing i love about him is he's stayed true to his sound regardless of the changes in the music industry. Yep. Like yep. even in his sets, you know, he's just doing his own thing. There's no, I'm trying to follow this trend or I'm trying to keep up with, you know, these new artists that have become headliners now. You just, you just do your own thing. Like, yeah. which I think is amazing. Like he doesn't compromise his artistic vision 
after all these years. So I think that's in, in, like big ups to Fatboy Slim, you know. Yeah, big ups, man. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, he's a to- <laughs> total, total legend. What was uh, what was your the the first U.S. tour like for you guys? What kind of memories do you have from that? I'm always curious, like people's <laughs> first time coming over here. It was crazy. Yeah, so amazing. We actually going over. We um, our flight was delayed four hours from Heathrow. Um, which meant we actually missed our connecting flight in Toronto. Yeah. In Toronto, um, which meant that we actually arrived on the day we were playing in Vegas. Oh, yeah. Um, so we were supposed to arrive the day before, stay in a hotel, wake up, and then be like, okay, we're playing today. We can yeah. go. But yeah. realistically, we woke up in Toronto the day we were playing, had to change our flight, big faff, probably about 36 hours total. Knackered. Travel, absolutely tired. <laughs> arrived in Vegas and we're like, look at the watch and we're like, we're on in two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. Look straight there. Uh, Fly, yeah. Flying so, into like one of the least chill cities in the entire yeah, yeah. country. Yeah. And like, we'd never, we've never been to Vegas before. So we were like, we we're like little puppies going like, there's your overload. It was sensory <laughs> overload. Yeah. Well, like, cause Vegas really, is not even like a real place, you know, Vegas is some uh, <laughs> like bizarre, like psychedelic nightmare, you know? <laughs> it's so weird. Yeah. It's a strange nightmare plonked in the middle of a desert and there's like such amazing, nice view over there of this huge tower. And then you look to the left and there's just the human shit on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, like okay. what the hell? <laughs> the, the juxtaposition of things that I'm seeing right now, you go to see the palace and you walk around, there's high end clothing stores. And then you can walk outside and there's, a used needle on the floor and it's like, what's yeah. going on? <laughs> yeah, it did. Exactly. I mean, it's a, it's a monument to, to capitalism, right? Cause it's just like, yeah, it, should it, not, it should not exist, but it's just whoever, you know, I don't know the history of Vegas that well, maybe I shouldn't even talk about it, but it's basically my, <laughs> my take on it is just like they, whoever's building it, you just refuse to not have it exist so you just as much money as it takes to pump it yeah. to start it to keep it going just keep the money flowing and like that to me is like that's the the lifeblood of vegas under all of it it's just like money <laughs> <Yeah>. flowing <laughs> yeah to be fair it was it was really fun like that's oh, a the, great like, town yeah we oh, yeah. yeah. enjoyed it um where'd you yeah. play in vegas it was life is beautiful festival oh well that's a great u.s debut that yeah. was our <laughs> first ever u.s show life is beautiful festival <laughs> It was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was really, really good. Then we flew over to, uh, LA. Um, we did a bit of a writing session, did a couple of days in LA doing writing, um, over there, which is actually where we made hot the latest single. Yeah. Um, we wrote that in LA, uh, which is quite fun. A few days in LA, then went down to San Diego, did cross festival. Oh, that's uh, great. The after parties at Crossed as well. That's actually where we met Fatboy Slim at Crossed. Oh, yeah. amazing. Nice. Yeah, I lived in San Diego for like five, six years. Oh, San Diego is a great town. It's such a great place. I think you were tell- asking me the other day, you said, if you could live in any of the cities that we've played in, where would you live? And that's my response was San Diego. <laughs> it's <laughs> kind of the perfect place, man. It really is. It's like... The, so chill. Yeah, it's chill. It's the best weather like mm. year round of maybe anywhere it's close enough to LA that you can get up there whenever you need to, but you don't have to like live in like the craziness of LA. Yeah. I, yeah, man, it's, it's a good spot. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to go back one day. Yeah. Yeah. It's so have you done just the one U S tour so far or have you been yes, back yeah. a few times? Yeah. So potentially we might be going back out, um, this year, I think June or July, I think it's still it's still um, being got, planned. We've got a couple of shows that have given us offers. We're just sort of tweaking and working a tour yeah. around some yeah. dates at the moment. But we should get out there at some point this year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the whole visa process was so expensive and so convoluted to get out there the first time. Oh. We we need to really like <laughs> I mean, get out there again. So otherwise, I think I think we we, we lose money on the the, the visa process. Yeah, fucking if crazy. If I mean, have you guys been following? There's this whole thing in the U.S. right now. They proposed legislation to like raise visa fees significantly, uh, and really? there's been oh, it, it's not good. Yeah, and the, there's been this like movement from artists in the U.S. to like protest against it, and they had like a like a pub this is just yesterday i think i posted on the like public comment thing but yeah there's like a public comment form where you know the legislation is proposed and then people can comment on it that sort of thing and so there's this big movement to like 
get a million people to, you know, comment that they yeah. shouldn't do it, that kind of thing. But yeah, man, it's, uh, yeah, because it's already so tough. I, I talk Make about, fun. I try to talk about that because I don't think anyone in the U.S. who doesn't deal with this shit knows how hard it is for people not living here to come here and work. Yeah, we don't even see yourself play. in the foot because it's just going to turn away potential huge acts to be able to come over here and 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 sort of up and coming acts as well. Um, yeah. You're going to lose out on a lot of sort of yeah like good culture. good talent coming yeah. over. Yeah. And I think like I mean in comparison, we're looking at Australia as well later this year. And our manager was like, "Yeah, Australia is so easy compared to the US. <laughs> yeah. It's like." <laughs> couple of, a couple of hundred pounds and sign a few yeah, forms you're and, and you're over there. Yeah, it's you can like, basically just show up. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. It was actually really funny because when we showed up in the US, the uh, person who was on the uh, border border, check, patrol. border patrol checking our visas, he thanked us and said, guys, there isn't many people in your industry that actually do the visas properly, so I'd like to thank you. Oh. A, lot of people, a lot of people apparently come over and just sort of wing it and sort of do a sneaky on them and, and yeah. don't do it all above board. I'm, but, I'm sure uh, people wait. try, yeah. Although that's that's a nice interaction because usually the, the reputation of our border guards is not great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad you guys had a good experience. Yeah, we did. It was nice. I did want to make sure I asked you guys sort of talking more about like your sound and where it's going. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I, because you mentioned you, you wrote hot while you were in LA. Yeah. Um, that too. I mean, that, am I right in saying that that's like your guys biggest tune so far? Yeah. Um, it's a funny one actually, because the, the, the reason for hot was, we basically got really drunk with, with our US agent and basically he said to us like, just like advice about, you know, how we can grow our career. And he said something that stuck with us <laughs> till, the stu- till we got to the studio, which was, you guys need to make a tune which sexy girls could dance to. And you I was like, to make a tune and make the sexy girls dance. Yeah. It's probably about like, <laughs> he's, he's, so he's very LA. Yeah. Uh, very, that's a good, that's a good LA accent. I like that. Yeah. To make the sexy girls dance. You guys have got the guys dancing to all your shows. You gotta make the sexy girls dance. Yeah. Let's try it. Which, <laughs> not stuff, hey, yeah. Honestly, not bad advice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of stuff is quite melancholic. We yeah. don't really make like happy stuff. So we were like, we need to change our tune. Let's 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 make something happy. Let's make something like upbeat and you know big scene at a festival. So that's where that's where hot came about. Yeah. Um. And yeah, it's, it's worked out pretty well. So yeah, happy days really. Yeah. Well, and I think I, I mean it's it's a great tune, and you know there's like elements of of garage in there, elements of like old baseline stuff, and. It's funny because I think since then, even which is not that long ago, but like that almost seems more relevant now. Like I feel like Garage is having a bit of a moment in general. Like in a way, I feel like you guys sort of were a little early on on what was going to come back into the underground with that tune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that we will always say, like as me and Ken and our manager, it's like how do we beat a sort of trend before it's a trend because yeah. everyone could jump on a trend and by the time you're you've got some music out that's on that trend you've already lost it so it's like you've got to be thinking what's gonna be on trend before it is and it's like okay well let's think about it and i think it was sort of the time that um baddest of the more interplanetary criminal started coming up and started blowing up a little bit and that is sort of like very similar sort of garagey sort of baseline m1 organ sort of thing i think Sound of Summer, really. Yeah, the Sound of Summer. Yeah, the, what we wanted to be making wasn't emulating that, but it was emulating that feeling of sort of like being in the sun, nostalgia. And I think it did really well in Australia at the time because when we released it, it was their summer. So it da- started doing the rounds on the festival circuit around there. And I mean, it hasn't had a UK summer yet to be sort of going around, but it might get a second wind during our summer, I mean, we're like three three months away from our yeah. summer. Yeah. So by that time, it might get a second wind of sort of being blasted out of the festival season. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Be amazing. We wouldn't mind that. Yeah. <laughs> These <old DJs>. <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, has the has the touring been sort of picking up steadily for you guys? Are you like how busy are you right now? It, touring yeah, wise, uh, music wise, like, do you feel like there's a lot going on? 
Yeah. So fun, funny story. Last week I quit my job. Well, I, I f- formally finished my job to do music full time. Congrats. Just congrats. Because, yeah, That's thank, great. thank you. <laughs> um, just because, um, like the bookings have been picking up. Um, like we've, we're doing, um, a UK Europe tour, like a few, sh- few shows. Uh, we're supporting Yotto and another tour supporting Elderbrook. And in between that, we've got like our own headline shows around UK. Um, and obviously potentially going back out to America and Australia, New Zealand later in the year. Um, it's been, we've been very fortunate that, you know, it's, it's all coming hot fast, I guess. And That's I ride away, really. Well, it's like, it's funny because it's like, it's, it's too slow until it's too fast, you know? It's yeah. like, <laughs> there's, there's very little in between that, I feel like. Yeah. What was the, what was the old job out of curiosity? What were you doing? Sure. Um, so I used to be a UX designer. Oh, okay. So I used to do, um, uh, like designing apps and stuff like that, like designing solutions to, to stuff. Um, yeah, I loved it. It was, it was a creative job. Um, it's very similar aspects to music as well. There's a bit of, you know, technical skill involved. Um, the creativity comes in like how things look visually, um, and how they interact with, you know, people or how you can make something we're going a bit nerdy here. No, no, like, this is good. It's um, an app, so it's functional for people whilst looking nice. Essentially, that's that's the the job. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that's I mean, that's that's making music, right? Like making music yeah. is you know sitting in front. I mean, dance music. It's sitting in front of the computer, moving little bricks around. Like it's a very <laughs> weird mechanical thing that you do in order to like if you're very good at it and you do your job right somebody has like an emotional reaction to this like yeah. weird mechanical thing you've done, you know? It's really weird. It's interesting to, to put it that way as well. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, well, I mean, it makes me wonder for your guys' music too, which is like, you know, because I, I was reading up, I was like looking at old interviews and like things people have written about you. And this is this is something pretty much everyone who writes anything about you guys says is that it's like emotional music, Right. And there's yeah. like somehow there's this emotion, this sort of through line, regardless of what it sounds like, like it still feels like you guys. It has that whatever that feeling is, the whether it's melancholy or nostalgia or in hot, it's like a happy feeling. But, it, you know, there's like this emotion to it. And I, I always wonder for for people who make music like you do, like if we're talking about this sort of weird mechanical like uh, body versus brain dichotomy kind of thing. Like, you know, to make a song emotional, to make emotional music that still hits hard on the dance floor, all that, like, is there a mechanical process of capturing emotion while you're producing? Yeah. I feel like, like essentially the way I see it is production is a tool to express emotions, like as a foundation, so there is always techniques you can do in production to express it how you want to express it. For example, you know, like what we said earlier, like we try to make our tracks organic, something that is always moving. So whether that's changing like the the way a, a synth sounds from the cutoff to the attack, uh, the release, or even the drums, you know, spice it up a little bit. Do you want something a bit more industrial feeling? You you can put a like a flanger on it or make it sound metallic or do you want to make it sound more soft? There's there's different ways to express it. Even, even though it's like, you know, it's quite a mechanical, like technical thing, making music, producing it. But I think you can express the emotion that you want to express through these little techniques, if you call it. Yeah. Yeah, I think as we've we've progressed in our sort of production pathway and career, we've learned these sort of little different techniques and different things of how to, to, to emote on the dance, like on into our music and then express that onto the dance floor. So you can have different techniques of like building up tension and then releasing it onto a drop. So sort of like filtering a lot of the music just before a drop is something that disclosure do quite well. Everything feels sort of like spacious. Yeah. Yeah. In and then it'll spl- explode on a drop um, and things like that. And that can, that can give like a happy emotive feeling. Um, and then it's the use of samples as well. I think we we get a lot of the emotion from mm. sort of samples. A lot of the tracks that we've got, such as Isolate Traces, Ikaro, these big sort of emotive numbers, 
they're all based around samples. Yeah. Um, yeah. sort of big Bulgarian choirs, things like that. Um, yeah. which we love digging around for, like on YouTube, vinyl, things like that. We've got a big collection of sort of things that we know that one day we're going to use as a sample because we just save it yeah. and just sort of come to the studio and go, you know what, let's use it like that. Yeah, so the really interesting point there is like you can show emotion through other music that you listen to. So, for example, when we heard um, the Caro sample, it's quite haunting, it's quite a... You know, there's some darkness to it, but that's in um, the Bulgarian choir. The way they their 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 music is, you know, yeah. that's the the key part of the key fingerprint of their music that they make in that like sphere. So it just worked perfectly to kind of you know how can we accentuate this sample around our productions so it, it elevates it to like another platform, another level. Yeah, of yeah. course, and I, I think there's something to the fact that uh, at least for me, like I don't speak that language. And so it's, I, mm. I don't actually know what they're saying in that sample, right? But it's, it, that almost helps in a way. It, it, it's yeah. like cutting the language part out of it. My brain, I can't even think about that. I can't analyze it because I just don't know. And so all you're getting is like the pure emotion, the pure feel of it. Because you mm. can, you know, a human voice singing a note like we all know, you know, sort of what that means to us and how that hits us. And if that person is singing it in a particularly happy or sad way, like that's something you can feel. That's an interesting way to think about sampling. It's like, yeah, if you if you want to make a, if you're feeling a certain way, maybe try finding a song or a sample that emulates that feeling for you and see what you can do with that and maybe if you do a good job then other people can feel it it's an interesting way to kind of use use a sample to like translate a feeling you know what i mean yeah, yeah exactly and when, when we listen to the various samples we, we get these various different feelings and then put that into the music and the production just sort of comes naturally really because it, you base it around the sample itself so like you listen to something you go i already know where this track's going to go i already know that the chords i already know the, the sort of drums the bass i know the feeling i want to get on the breakdown because the sample's basically done all my work for me yeah 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 i think that's right no and and that's another thing too with your guys music i i liked is that you know you feature sampling prominently because i think that's it's it's part of the history of dance music. And when I was talking about sort of the the commercialization and the EDM stuff earlier, that's another thing I think was getting lost a bit in that wave was, yeah. again, because I, I always go back to blaming capitalism, but it's like because of money, <laughs> like labels didn't want to clear samples. And, you know, I think a lot of younger kids were being taught, like, don't sample anything because that's going to like you won't be able to post it and it'll hurt your reach and, you know, that kind of thing. Like you'll get a copyright strike, all that yeah. kind of stuff. And to me, that's, I get that. But at the same time, it's like, that's, that's the heart of what we do. And that's like, I don't know, it may be just because I came up sampling stuff. And I feel like that's such a good tool for people not to use just to make cool music, but to learn how to do it and to learn about other yeah. eras of music, all that kind of stuff. No, totally. I feel like, you know, sampling, we're, it's out, it, there's so much music out there that you can utilize that, that is meant to be utilized. And I think in other genres, you know, not just electronic music, like hip hop, that's such a prominent part. Um, it's just a shame that, you know, copyright, things like this do get in the way, which I do understand, you know, you need to properly credit the, course, yeah. the people who, you know, created these original samples. But I think um, it's definitely a great, way a great way to learn and also a great way to express emotion in your music you know it's a different way of production i think sampling than to your to your standard like you know putting i don't know drums and creating a synth it's like a different part i guess mm -hmm. to it yeah absolutely yeah because it's the difference between like learning about a thing and being the thing because you can you know you can listen to an old song and get inspiration from it but if you're actually working with pieces of an old song in your creation that's a whole another layer of of creativity i don't know to me that unlocks so much more than kind of just like studying you know how it yeah. used to be done that kind of thing 
I think yeah. it, overall, I the the whatever this rant that I'm doing is is like <laughs> the the point is kind of like it's always sad to me if somebody stops their creativity because of some rule that they've been told. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like to me, it's always better to just do the punk thing to just do it. if you want to sample something sample it and then figure the rest out later like that, yeah, totally. that to me is how it has to be absolutely i feel like as well sampling in my personal opinion is harder than sound design i think finding the perfect sample for the track that you want to make is is such a hard thing to do there's so many it's like having to put pick from unlimited options but there's going to be that one option in yeah. amongst the unlimited which is like perfect for what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's harder than actually having to craft a sound that you want to make because it's quite formulaic in the end of the day. Like when you do sound design, you, you learn to kind of know how to create a specific sound by, you know, I know if I want to use a, a sine wave or a square wave, the combination of two, whereas sampling, there's so many variables to it. So I do have a lot of respect for sampling. Yeah. And the way you guys are doing it too, I think is, is oh, very thanks, interesting. Man. Yeah, no, it's, it's super cool, man. It's, it's a unique thing that you guys are doing. And so I'm glad that you're, you're only expanding it. I mean, it makes me as, as we're kind of bringing it home, maybe that's a good way to ask. Like, you know, we talked about aspirations for a live show. We talked about upcoming tour, you know, eventual album dreams, that kind of thing. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that's going on right now that uh, you want to talk about anything else on your mind in general before we wrap it up? Yeah, we've got new music coming out soon. Um, so I think April, 7th April is going to be our next single, uh, which is kind of in between that hot sound and the more left field sound. Um, so yeah, just really excited to get that out. Um, we've had, we've been hammering it in our DJ sets for a long time now, and it's had a lot of good support as well from a lot of people that we, we look up to. So just excited to, for the world to hear it really. Well, it's cool too. We didn't talk so much about this. Like you mentioned Pete Tong a little bit and all that, but it, yeah. it's it's also cool. It seems like a lot of a lot of the old guard have been very supportive of what you guys are doing. Like a yeah. bunch of a bunch of legends kind of just picking up the vibe and and really yeah. appreciating um, it. Yeah, That's, I mean people people like people like we used to grew up grow up listening to John Hopkins, Bonobo, and those sorts of people that we adhere to be like gods in, in the yeah. realm <laughs> um there's big supporters of our music um which is absolutely crazy to say but yeah like you said pete tong annie mack was a massive supporter when she was at radio one um and then the new people coming in for radio one have our backs as well i mean the whole radio one team have always had our backs which is incredible um jaguar danny sarah on the friday night show um yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really it's really crazy see these sort of people you idolize supporting your music yeah it feels nice because we we came from being bedroom producers you know just making music in the little little room um i mean it's upgraded now a little bit but <laughs> still a little room <laughs> yeah yeah but, um yeah like you never really thought anything of it we just made music man like you know you just do your thing like whatever happens happens we even try to to make music a career we just made tunes and put it out and we're just lucky that you know, people enjoy it and incredibly thankful for all the support um, from all the big legends, even the people, like, you know, anyone, people listening, because um, we, yeah, we just love it, really. We just make music. It's, it's, that's beautiful, man. I mean, you you kind of just answered my next question, but what I wanted to ask was sort of, do you have, do you think about sort of keeping yourself in that place mentally as far as just being like, excited and grateful and all that sort of thing like you know well things are getting bigger you're getting busier i'm sure certain stresses come and go you know that sort of thing of like you know even like quitting your job that sort of thing is like a yeah. big big decision is there anything you guys do either like mentally or physically or a hobby or or anything to sort of keep yourself in a good place mentally with all of this yeah, so I mean, I, I, I go to the gym quite a yeah. bit. I think that's a good place, especially to listen to music as well, like listen to new music. I always go to the gym and then come back feeling inspired by the music yeah. that I listen to. 
Um, you know, Ken's now started going to the gym and since he's, yeah. since he's, um, <laughs> he's quit his job. I think it's, I would recommend it to anyone who wants routine in their life. I and mean, I feel like if you're in a creative sort of industry, routine is quite difficult to sort of come by yeah. because you, no one is really over you going, they haven't really got a boss. No one's going, what time is this? Like, why are yeah. you up at this time? You yeah. can get up whenever you want, as long as you get a few things done. But I think like having that sort of one thing that's routine every day, like going to the gym, going on yeah. a walk, going on a run, listening to a certain amount of music, cooking some food or something like that. That's a, it's a big part of your routine. It, it, it's difficult to sort of like maintain a constant stream of routineness. Yeah. I think like a big one for me is cooking. I really enjoy cooking. Um, in my, any kind of spare time I have, um, when I'm not playing a show, I like to make something a bit more, you know, bigger, a bit more difficult. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I just find it therapeutic where you can just like shut off for a bit and just chop some stuff <laughs> yeah, right. in front of the pan and, and nod very happily at, at the pan. So yeah, I, I love food as well. Like food is a big, a big passion. Um, so it's quite nice. Like when we do shows abroad, I can, you know, try some new food, like yeah. something different. Um, yeah. What's, I think uh, bit, what's your specialty? Passion. What do you cook? Oh, it, var- it varies. Like last weekend I made, um, Thai green curry paste from scratch. Ooh, that's so good. we had the old more, more pestle, just smashing that down. Uh, just something. So I, I love Thai food, so I was like, I want to make my own paste, man. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> just use it. Um, do you know Lidl? In I don't know if it's, it's like a US thing. Oh it's yeah, a, it's yeah, just yeah. Market, yeah, yeah, yeah. The so store, yeah. Thing um, every week where it's called Flavor of the Week, where they bring in ingredients that are specific to like a cuisine. And one of the weeks they did Greek and they had octopus tentacles. And I was like, I want to make octopus salad or something. So uh got it, uh did it, didn't didn't turn out that great, I'll be honest. <laughs> uh but you know, we we move and we try. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <Get fun. laughs> well, and yeah. I'll I'll say this too about cooking and about working out. Both I I do a fair amount of both myself, and I agree, Andy, about that point with routines too. I think that's key. And I, with both of those activities, there's something about it, it shuts off a certain part of your brain because you have to concentrate on, you know, either like, yeah, doing the exercise or chopping the thing or making sure the the pan doesn't burn, whatever it is. So you have to you have to focus like the conscious part of your mind. But I think for creativity in a weird way, like it frees up whatever is in the back of our minds too. like it's like you were saying, you'll listen to music and come away inspired. And it's that kind of stuff, too. Like I've even solved problems in my own production, like something I couldn't figure out with a song, like while I was on the treadmill or something. And it's not because I'm consciously thinking about it, but it's just like you're focusing on what you're doing and then somehow like it just pops into your head. You know what I mean? It's a weird creativity is weird that way. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it deters burnout to some extent because you're, you're, like you said, you're focusing on something else. You're not, I think with with music, when you make it, it's, it's a lot of concentrating, a lot of brain power in terms of what I'm trying to achieve this sort of thing. How do I do it? Whereas at the gym or cooking, you sort of just shut off and you're just, you know, doing whatever you're doing, like moving the pan about, lifting some weights. And you just don't have to think too much. You can just like be in your own little world. Yeah. So maybe that's in terms of like burnout or something. Yeah. It's it's like this weird like shortcut to creativity, I think. Cause you know, it's like if you're in the studio and you know an idea just comes to you sometimes right and it's not like you sit there thinking and thinking thinking sometimes you just get this weird idea throw it in and it works and you just run with it and like oftentimes those are the best ideas and i think there's there's something to that of like figuring out how to turn off your brain just enough yeah totally i think it's super important um especially with how chaotic like the whole DJ life can be is you do need those times to just get away from the the sheer chaos of everything, the busyness, the lack of sleep, the, the loud music. Um, yeah. it's nice to be in your own space, I guess. Well, so the, the last question, simple thing. It's the same question I asked at the end of most of these episodes, just looking for a, a memory from your life, a moment from your life could be from any time from when you were a kid or five minutes ago, anytime. When in that memory, in that moment, 
music really really hit you hard, really had an impact on you in that memory. And that could be something as simple as, uh, you know, you're in a good mood and the right song played and it was just a nice memory or something you shared with a loved one or you just got broken up with and the sad song played and you start crying, you know, <laughs> anything like that. Kind of just the first thing you think of. Uh, yeah, I'll go first if you haven't got one, Ken. Um, so yeah, at a festival, again, same festival, I saw Fatboy Slim, um, saw Tudor Cinema Club. Um, I was on my friend's shoulders for what you know, their big track that came on. I just remember there was a video of me uh, with my top off swinging it around <laughs> on my friend's shoulders, <laughs> singing the words. And yeah, it was just one of those moments of like just pure joy, yeah. like in a, a festival in the yeah. mountains in Spain in 30 degree heat, listening to one of your favorite bands, listening to one of your favorite songs on your shoulders of one of your friends. Just a good great moment. I think yeah. we all had uh, we all bought cigars as well from the local <laughs> town, and I think during Green Day we all we all lit up the cigars. <laughs> Being eighteen years old, we've never smoked cigars before, so we're like, "What the hell is this?" Yeah. <laughs> we, as well. we oh, thought we were so, yeah, yeah, you're like you're inhaling, doing it wrong, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 popping up everything. Uh, so that would be mine probably. Oh, that's beautiful. I, think, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I think mine's a bit more not as chaotic, it's a bit more nostalgia. Um, so whenever we did like long car journeys with my family, my dad would always put Steely Dan on. And um, just for some reason, that that just gives me quite a warm, fuzzy feeling. I had, I had a lot of memories, like really good memories, listening to Steely Dan and every like big car journey, going to like family holidays and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, just... It could, when I think about it, I'm like, oh, that was that was really nice. Like, yeah, so simple. But oh man, I mean, because that both of those memories I love because they both sort of speak to the same same core thing, which is like music can can elevate these moments in our lives, and you know, sound like the soundtrack to our lives makes the life so much more meaningful, right? And it's like yeah. the music is like what crystallizes those moments what would otherwise be just like a nice memory becomes this like really poignant thing because mm. it has this soundtrack. And then the fact that, you know, you guys are now sort of participating in this and, you know, there's maybe, yeah. maybe someone hears something you did and has a moment that is meaningful to them. And it's yeah. kind of this cool, yeah. like cycle that, that we're all participating in. I think that's really nice. Yeah. yeah. I think it's beautiful because obviously you listen to that music and these songs can come on at any point. You can listen, you can go to a bar with just one of your friends and you hear that song come on mm. and you're like, it triggers that memory and you go, do you remember when we were at BBK up that mountain yeah. and I was on the same shoulders and I had my top off swinging it around? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it happens at like all these point in times and I really hope that, yeah, through, throughout the years and growing up, yeah. like when we're 40 to 50, those memories still stay and we collect more memories of those yeah. times. And I mean... They might, those memories might be happening when you don't even know they're happening. Right. And then like 10 years, 20 years from now, you can be like looking back on now. Like I'm sure some tracks that we're making, we might listen back in 20 years time and then remember oh, those that. moments and stuff. It's like, oh, I remember making that song. It's yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. I think it's nice as well. Like kind of come back to what you said. It, I think music helps to make the really simple moments a little bit more special. Like it's just something like it just elevates it even though it's such a mundane thing that you're doing, it just changes the the memory that, that to the core, you know? Um, so yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you're right. And, and you just made me realize that that's like, you know, how grateful I am that, cause everyone agrees with what you just said, right. That like music makes yeah. moments more poignant, but then, yeah, you just made me super grateful. I was like, fuck, it's amazing that like we get to participate in that, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i'm crazy that that's great man that's like the best feeling to leave this on i think <laughs> yeah, always win the egg. <laughs> yeah. no it's perfect man how, how do you guys feel you feel all right yeah yeah man yeah, that was just, that was great really nice. yeah Good. i really yeah. really enjoyed that me too man thank you guys so much for doing it and uh yeah hopefully i'll, I'll see you in the states uh sometime later yeah, this year yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah yeah we'll catch up soon mate absolutely man yeah stay in touch please and it's great chatting with you guys no problem. Peace, brother. All right, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Yes.